DiscerningHearts.com presents Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, by David Torkington. David Torkington, the author of The Wisdom from the Western Isles, has re-edited and abridged the work for broadcast. He is also the narrator. The book was originally published as three separate spiritual novels, Peter Calvay, Hermit, Peter Calvay, Prophet, and Peter Calvay, Mystic. We begin with the first part, the hermit, but including some passages from Peter Calvay, mystic, so as to give an overall view of the spiritual journey for listeners. We now present Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, Episode 9, True Christian Contemplation, narrated by David Torkington. It was Monday morning, my last day on the island of Barra, and I was having breakfast with Father Callum, the parish priest. Peter Calvey, the hermit whom I'd come to consult about my spiritual life, would be arriving shortly for our final meeting. But before he arrived, I wanted to ask Father Callum to finish the story he was telling me the day before. What you told me about the Highland clearances was terrible, I said. But what about the law? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, there was the law, he said, but the law was on the side of the Highland chiefs. It was the chiefs who actually owned the land. The rest were only tenants with short leases, lasting no more than a year. It was the law that drove them out of their homes. It was the law that herded them onto their overcrowded transporters to take them to America, Canada, or even Australia, where many of them died of starvation. That's if they escape the plague or the pox. Oh, dreadful! It was second only to the slave trade in its inhuman barbarity, said Father Callum. Peter's cottage was built by an islander who was transported to make room for sheep. He paused momentarily. Angus MacNeil had built his house on Calvé some fourteen years before thinking that if the clearances were to come, he would be safe on one of the remotest islands in the Hebrides. But he was not. It was a cold winter's day, the 4th of December, 1851. The constables battered down the door, dragged out the family. They handcuffed him and then dragged them off to the boat with his wife and their two wee girls of eight and eleven years of age, He paused for a moment, shaking his head at the hideous cruelty of the whole episode. It doesn't seem possible, I said. How did you come to hear the whole story? Because that eleven-year-old girl was my grandmother, said Father Callum. His voice was shaking with emotion. I heard the whole story from her own lips in 1922, when she was eighty-two. She died in 1930 at the age of 90. Good grief, I gasped. Father Callum was close to tears. I'm sorry, he said, as he hastily left the room, but sometimes the memory of the past can still get to me. Not at all, I replied. You've every right to be angry. I'm angry myself that such a dreadful thing could happen, that human beings could possibly treat one another in such an inhuman way. I told Peter what had just happened the moment he arrived. Of course he knew the story, and he told me even more horrific details of the eviction, but time was running out. So Peter seemingly changed the subject and began to speak to me about the meaning of Christian contemplation that he promised to explain the previous day. I'm sorry if I seem to be changing the subject so quickly, as if the evils of the past are of no importance, Peter said, but the truth is that such evils, and even greater evils, are still going on now, as they were going on in the Second World War, that we're still trying to come to terms with. And these evils will continue to build up again and threaten to overwhelm us if we do not see these evils 
It is not because they are not there. It is simply that we are blind or suffering from moral myopia, a spiritual short-sightedness caused by the evil that is within us. In short, we are living in cloud cuckoo land. It is the teaching of the church that the devil exists and that we are beset by evil, not only that surrounds us, but seeps into us without us hardly noticing it, until others see it in how we behave when we're caught off our guard. And the great tragedy is, perhaps the greatest tragedy of humankind since time immemorial, is that we believe that we can confront it and we can overcome it alone, and we can't. We are fools if we think we can, and if we act as if we can, then we will be destroyed by our own pride. But what can we do, I said, eager for Peter to continue. Let me explain, he answered, by giving you an analogy. It is as if we are a city under siege, surrounded by evil enemies bent on bursting in and venting all their pernicious impulses on the inhabitants. And to make matters worse, there are enemies within us too, traitors, making the position seem hopeless. Alone, our world is doomed, and the vain belief that we can overcome these enemies by directly confronting them ourselves is indeed a forlorn hope, the forlorn hope of a forlorn humanity. But there is hope, one hope alone. What if a messenger could be sent to bring reinforcements? That this messenger exists we know for sure. That he can be successful is certain. Whether or not we can avail ourselves of his bravery is quite another matter. The name of the messenger and the reason why he can succeed, has succeeded, Peter added hastily, is contained in his very name. Then what is his name, I asked. I was already sitting on the edge of my seat. His name is our divine Lord, Peter said slowly and emphatically. He is our Lord because that's what he wants us to call him, because he has chosen to be one of us, to belong to us. But he is nevertheless our Lord. But as he said himself, he did not come to lord it over us, but to serve us. And the greatest service that one person can perform for another is to love them and then lead them to the only source of love that can change their lives and change their lives permanently for the better. Now, he is called our divine Lord because before he came to rescue us, his own divine nature was caught up from all eternity in a never-ending exchange of love without measure with the infinitely loving God who he called Father and told us to do likewise. This is the messenger, our messenger, who when he went back for help from where he came was able to help us like never before because he took back with him the human nature that he assumed to live amongst us and finally rescue us. For now... The love that he received before and without measure and from all eternity could be given to us, from his human nature into our human nature, to arm us with the most powerful energy for good in heaven or on earth, infinite loving. He arms us by drawing us up into his loving Father and his mystical contemplation of his Father, where, as he gazes lovingly upon his infinite loving, that loving bonds them both together, and both of them experience the unending joy and glory of ecstatic bliss. This is the true archetypal act of contemplation into which we are invited once we have developed the beginnings of divine love by meditating on that divine love made flesh and blood in Jesus Christ. Now we must see what happens when meditation leads to true Christian contemplation. Once meditation 
has led us into contemplation, true Christian contemplation, which is our divine Lord's own loving of his Father, then what should we expect? I suppose the answer would be that we would expect to experience the same ecstatic joy that he experiences. But sadly, we would be wrong. Perhaps that's why so many who have come so far get disillusioned and begin to look elsewhere for what they hope they would find in their prayer. The truth of the matter is, like his mother Mary, Jesus was conceived without sin, and we are not. So, although there is nothing in him, or in her for that matter, that can prevent them from experiencing the divine contemplation in which the completion of the Christian life is to be found, that is not true of us. We are born into a world beset by sin and selfishness. Nor can we overcome it alone, either in ourselves or in others. That is why we must put all our hope in the messenger, our divine Lord. Then, to do all in our power, with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who raised him from the dead, to seek out and enter into his divine contemplation, to receive what can only save us from ourselves and from the one who would destroy us. Now, we can see why our divine Lord has been called Mediator, because he is the go-between, the Pontifex Maximus, the bridge-maker who unites the finite with the infinite. He is our Redeemer too, because he alone can help us to recover from the debt of sin, which has been seriously dehumanizing us. The Saviour, who can alone save us from the salary of sin, which is more sin, and the misery that this brings to us personally and to the whole of humanity. Sin, therefore, and the salary of sin that has been corrupting us from within prevents us from the immediate and instant contemplation that we yearn for, namely the contemplation that was instantly available to Jesus and to his mother, Mary the mother of God, the first great mystic, because they were both without sin. This is why all the greatest saints and mystics from the beginning have insisted that a purification must take place within us before we can fully enter into Christ's ongoing contemplation of his Father's love and the mutual interchange of love that accompanies it. This purification and the result of this purification is of such utmost importance that the Church has canonized two great saints and mystics, St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila, and then done something further. It has made them both doctors of the Church, mystical doctors, to teach us about this purification, what it entails, and how to press on through it. Furthermore, they teach how it can lead us to the mystical marriage to experience in, with, and through Christ his union with our common Father and to receive there the fruits of contemplation that enable Christ to continue his work on earth through us. The first nine or so chapters of St. John of the Cross's book, The Dark Night of the Soul, details all the sin and all the selfishness that is preventing us from experiencing the joy of contemplation that we have been anticipating. It also describes the arid wilderness that we experience within us after the emotional highs that have exhilarated us in first fervour. Then, in this desert, he details the sins and imperfections of our human frailty. If they don't make us blush with embarrassment, particularly when we were experiencing what was called acquired contemplation at the heights of meditation, then we must be emotionally dead. Now, if despite everything, come hell or high water, we persevere in this arid wilderness, then St. Teresa of Avila becomes our encouragement. In her masterwork, Interior Castle, she describes how gradually we begin to experience the love of God breaking into our lives with ever-increasing power and presence. In the precious moments when contemplation becomes experiential, it becomes deeply satisfying and fulfilling. 
more exhilarating than any other experience we have received before. Furthermore, the fruits of contemplation are received too in ever greater abundance, giving us the wisdom to see where we should be going and how to proceed, but together with the strength to do it. Pride had prevented me from asking any, any questions of Peter because, quite frankly, I didn't really understand what he was really talking about, coming from a Protestant tradition. I should have known more about it, but I didn't. But I felt I should say something. So I said, how does a person pray then in this dark night? Because it seems that prayer as we've known it isn't possible anymore, at least as we've known it before. Good point, good question, said Peter. Let me explain. From the very beginning, the Catholic mystical tradition has always taught that at the outset of the mystic way, when we are first drawn into contemplation, it is of vital importance that we do all in our power to do but one thing. That one thing is to keep our deepest heart's desire fixed upon God come what may, though we do not feel anything. At least we do not feel anything except a continual desire for God that is never rewarded. And for our pains, we continually experience distractions and temptations and a dryness and aridity where, in meditation, we experienced only pleasure and joy, at least in its final stages. In order to keep our heart fixed upon God, the traditional teaching tells us to take a short prayer or a single word and repeat it gently over and over again. It is simple to pray when prayer seems easy and was so full of peace and joy. However, in the spiritual life, as in married life, real love is shown when you are prepared to go on giving, when you seem to be in an emotional limbo land, and when you seem to be receiving nothing in return. That is exactly how a person feels at the beginning of the mystic way, and that is why it is the place where real, selfless loving is learned as never before. The bounty hunters who have only come for what they can get out of God will not last very long. They will soon cut and run and begin to seek elsewhere what they cannot find in prayer. St. John of the Cross said that 90% give up prayer at this point because they don't understand what is happening and there doesn't seem to be anyone else who does. What is needed now is a good spiritual director who knows by personal experience how to guide you forward. But as such a person may be difficult to find, let me sum up the practical teaching on the use of the prayer of the heart in mystical prayer since the time of the Desert Fathers and before with a few suggestions of my own. Instead of choosing a single word to begin with, use a full sentence. Choose one that somehow sums up how you feel at the time, how you are relating to God, who seems to have taken his leave of you. Sentences from the scriptures, for instance, could be used like, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or, Father, that this chalice may be taken away from me, but not my will, your will be done. Or, out of the depth I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my prayer. Sometimes a sentence from the hymnal would seem appropriate, like, lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Or turn to the Jesus prayer, originally designed specifically for this particular moment in the mystic way. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or simply, Jesus, mercy, Mary, help, which was my mother's favourite prayer. Do not try to dwell on these prayers or intellectually inspect them. They are not to help you meditate, but to contemplate or to gaze upon God with a simple, uncluttered heart and mind. When you choose a sentence, choose one that seems to sum up exactly how you feel, not how you think you ought to feel. Then, repeat it over and over again to help keep your attention fixed on God, although he seems to have disappeared to talk to someone else of more importance, while at the same time it helps you to smother the distractions beneath 
a cloud of forgetfulness. In time, you will find the full sentence too long, and you will feel the need to reduce it to, say, My God, my God, or Out of the Depth, or Simply Lead Kindly Light, or Have Mercy on Me, a Sinner. Then the time will come when a single word is all you feel inclined to use, like God or Jesus, or some other word like mercy or help that you feel best represents your needs in this strange dark night. Finally, no words are necessary to keep your heart fixed on God, because as the magnetic pull of his love becomes tangible, words become less and less necessary to say what is more profoundly said in silence. In meditation, it is Jesus Christ who is the object of prayer. But at the beginning of the mystic way, it is always God. The believer begins to wonder where the sacred humanity has gone. It has gone nowhere. It is we who have gone more deeply into the sacred humanity, where in with him and through him we are praying and offering our sufferings to his Father with him. For many months an astronaut had been waking each morning to see the spaceship that was going to take him to Mars. Then one morning he awoke and looked out of the window to see that the spaceship had gone, disappeared. Oh no, he said, fearing that it had gone without him. Don't worry, said another astronaut. It hasn't gone. You are in it. And he was, and he was on his way to the destiny for which he believed he had been born. In true mystical contemplation, Christ has not gone far. He has taken us up into him and into his personal contemplation of his Father. In the mystic way, our prayer is more powerful than ever before, even though we may not feel we are praying at all. The person who remains faithful in this prayer becomes ever more open to receive the inflow of God's love, his Holy Spirit, who brings about a profound purification within us. This enables us to be more at one with Christ in his act of loving the Father than we have been in the past, and more open to receive from the Father the love that draws us relentlessly onwards into the life of the three-in-one. St. Catherine of Siena said that if you have no patience, it's ten to one, that you don't have any other virtues either. She insists that true patience can only be found through prayer. Now, she doesn't just mean by praying for patience, although that's a good start, but by practicing patience inside of prayer itself. Most of us give up prayer before we've really started because nothing happens and we're too impatient to learn how to wait on God. No matter where you begin or how you progress, the time will come when you have done all that you can do. Then you have to learn how to wait on God. It is here that a person learns by practical experience that it is not they who are in control, but God. He comes when he chooses, not when we choose. Our job is to be ready at all times to receive him. Then, in what St. Teresa of Avila calls the prayer of recollection, a gentle absorption in God brings a sense of inner peace despite the distractions. This same experience increases as the awareness of God's action intensifies to what she calls the prayer of quiet. Then, when the intensity increases to the point that there are no longer any distractions at all to hinder our absorption in God, she calls it the prayer of full union. This is ultimately surpassed when the intensity of God's love cannot be sustained and moments of ecstasy occur. These experiences of divine love have a profound effect on the receiver, who is never the same again. It not only affects the person personally, but others too, who see something of the one whose love is being received at work within them. The fact that mystical contemplation is a pure gift of God is made clear as it comes and goes at God's good pleasure, not our own. 
Despite these brief but awesome experiences, they are but the prelude to a far more permanent experience that does not just take place in the head, but envelops the whole person, body and soul. This is sometimes called divinization or theosis in the Christian Eastern Church. In the West, it has been called the transforming union or the mystical marriage. In this, the ultimate experience of God's love on earth, the whole person, heart and mind, body and soul, tangibly feels something of the love that draws them into the vortex of life and love that endlessly revolves between the Father and the Son. It almost feels as if the life of the three-in-one opens to admit a fourth. I was heartbroken when Father Callum suddenly came in to announce that lunch was served, and there was no time to delay because the plane had already taken off from Glasgow Airport. At least it was not time for bed, because after all Peter had just said, I knew for sure that I would not have slept a wink. This concludes Episode 9, True Christian Contemplation, from Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, narrated by its author, David Torkington. To hear and or to download other episodes from this series, as well as hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it inside the Discerning Hearts free app, as well as on the Discerning Hearts YouTube channel. The music performed in this episode was by Catholic concert pianist Vincent Bellington, and the audio production of the program was produced and edited by Bobby Torkington. We hope that if this program has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, and if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation which is fully tax-deductible to help support the efforts of Discerning Hearts to bring listeners around the world freely spiritual formation of this kind. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us once again for more from Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, with David Torkington.